Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can I have roll call? Eric Connor? Here. Mary DeMore? Here. Joel Frederick? Here. Andy Mackey? Here. Art Schneider? Here. Greg Burt? Excuse. Jeff Bopo? Excuse. Joe Warner? Here. Larry McKelty? Here. This is an open meeting and has been noted as such. Do we have any citizens' comment? <coughs> okay. Moving on to consent agenda, we have approval of board minutes of October 28th, 2019, and approval of vouchers numbers 125186 to 125590 in the amount of $2.3 million in change in receipts for October in 2019, totaling 335000 in change, as well as the PVMS Europe trip for June of 2021. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, those are approved by consent. We will start with our student rep report. Good evening, everyone. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we have our November report here in front of you. So starting with MHS's report, on October 29th, Mr. Kashalik from the MHS Science Department held his astronomy stargazing outing in the Rolling Hills school parking lot where a variety of astrological happenings were seen by the students, and it was a very educational event. We have a few events from Parkview going on that we'd like to share also. So they had a global connections meeting, and the Exploring Mass Media and Adaptive, <coughs> adaptive Computers took part in a Flipgrid Global Connection Challenge. So their task was to create a 60-second video about the country or state that they lived in and share it with others around the world. In return, they were able to research information about their area and learn about other different countries and cultures from around the world. Another cool event that they were able, able to participate in was a collaboration with the Milwaukee Jewish Museum Education Center. And Nate Taffel, a 91-year-old Holocaust survivor, was able to share his story with the students. So Mr. Taffel fled from the Nazis and actually ended up in a labor camp and a concentration camp before he was liberated in 1945. But he had to learn that he lost much of his family. And the students were able to hear this message about the power of hope, perseverance, kindness, and love, and the importance of family. And they were all very grateful for the opportunity to meet him and learn about his story. Next up from Section Elementary, we wanted to highlight their event called Throwing Kindness Like Confetti where during the month of November, the Section Student Council held a fundraiser for Juan, which is a future Section Hawk who is currently fighting leukemia. Students purchased pieces of confetti and wrote the name of someone on it who shows kindness to others. They then added it to a bulletin board to show their kindness that those people spread. Prairie View Elementary School also ran an event to raise money for the Waukesha County Christmas Clearing Council. They raised money for families in need this Christmas, and were able to raise a total of $3,230. And it was $785 more than last year. And the Student Council will go shopping on Monday and all the toys will be donated to the Waukesha County Christmas Clearing Council. Big Bend Elementary wanted to highlight their spelling bee that took place this month with their three winners. Congratulations to those girls and all those who participated. Now Eagleville has had a very productive start to November with their monthly PBIS assembly, two wonderful Veteran Day speakers. They started their new Save Promise Club, who led the first um, World Kindness Day activities in their school. And they also ended their month with their One School, One Book celebration of Charlotte's Web. 4K students across the district have been busy learning and interacting with their community by visiting places like Elegant Farmer, the YMCA, and learning from firefighters, which those pictures do show on your report. Thank you, ladies. Next, we have the 2018-19 DPI report card. So Stephanie and Ben are going to do a brief presentation on the good news about the DPI report cards.
Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. yep. I was saying for everybody at home, I have to get news, used to new microphones now, including turning them on. All right, good evening. Ooh. All right, let's try that again. Um, so like Sean said, lots of good news on the DPI report cards that were recently released by the state. Um, so on the memo that I have provided with you, um, looking at the front page there, uh, our district score was an 83 uh, even, which is good for significantly exceeds expectations. That's five stars according to the DPI. Um, and then each of our elementary schools this year for the first time ever, each reached that category of significantly exceeds expectations as well. So it's a, a great accomplishment for our schools. Um, Parkview Middle School this year jumped a category as well. They uh, jumped up to exceeds expectations and that's four stars on the school report cards. And McGuanago High School stayed in that exceeds expectations category of four stars as well. Under that chart, I've got a couple of just tidbits from the report cards. Once again, M uh, MASD uh, placed very high amongst all K-12 districts. And again, trying to compare apples to apples, so this factors out our K-8 feeder schools, uh, like around Arrowhead, um, factors out just 9-12 Union High School, like Arrowhead Union. Just comparing those K-12, we placed 23rd out of 367 different schools, so that puts us for the top 7%. Um, you can see the other rankings as far as our overall achievement, um, English language arts and math achievement, so all very high ratings there as well and um, really strong ratings in our on-track and post-secondary readiness, which measures those attendance, graduation rates, third grade English language arts, eighth grade math, et cetera. A um, couple other things I wanna point out that aren't on here or that are briefly on here. First of all, all of our, L or all of our schools improved their scores over last year. Um, that's an accomplishment as well. I mean, it shows a lot of great work that our students and staff are doing. Um, it's, it's hard to keep raising those scores year after year. And so there's a lot of hard work to make that happen. A lot of focused work, and we'll talk about some of those things uh, in the strategic planning too that show up there. But um, that's a, an impressive accomplishment. And one other thing that highlights that, um, you know, the 25 or so schools last year that were school districts, that those K-12 districts that were ranked significantly exceeds expectations. Um, 13 of them last year fell out of those rankings, out of that top category, where we were able to hang up in there. And uh, another eight schools jumped into that category. So there's a little bit of churn in that top category, and to be able to, to maintain that um, the way that we do is really, really quite the accomplishment and something that we should be pretty happy about. Um, so that's page one. Any questions on the report cards? Again, a lot to celebrate there. I know that our buildings, when that information was released to them, um, they were very, students and staff, staff in particular, were very pleased, as they should be. Okay. Um, all right, so then one of the things that we've done this year is we've combined the report cards with the release of the state data. It just makes sense to put all of those into one conversation. They're all connected. They're all bits and pieces of the same puzzle, if you will. So um, deeper into that packet, you'll see some tidbits around forward exam. ACT Aspire and ACT. And then just prior to the meeting tonight, I handed you a revised set of graphs that have the correct color coding. So we'll go through those quickly here. Um, we're gonna lead off with forward exam. And <clears throat> two pieces that I like to highlight in each of these categories is how we performed overall, and then how we compared to the state and the Waukesha County comparables. Um, we're in a competitive county. Waukesha County Schools, I would put against any county in the state of Wisconsin. And so I think it's important context to take a look at those pieces. Uh, for forward exam, that's grades three through eight. Um, we increased our student proficiency overall by 1.2% from 1718 to 1819. Um, the state saw a drop of 1.5%, and also 13 of the 18 comparable districts that we're talking about. And these do include the K-8 feeders in Arrowhead saw a decline as well. So we bucked that trend. And you'll see that we bucked one in math as well where we saw an increase of about 7 tenths of a point over 1718. Um, the state saw a decline and about a dozen of the 18 Waukesha County comparables saw a decline as well. So some positive news coming out of forward exam. I know there's been a lot of really hard work at our elementaries and middle schools to try and um, certainly increase student achievement, but also get our students to 
perform the best they can to really demonstrate what they know on the forward exam. So some real positive news there. Um, ACT Aspire, which is new to this discussion this year. So we've administered ACT Aspire the last couple of years for the state, but last year we learned late, relatively late in the school year, that it would be counted on the report card for the first time. And not only was last year's ACT Aspire counted, but they retroactively counted it going back two years previous. So tests that we hadn't necessarily put a lot of energy into because they weren't a big part of the state assessment system, um, we were being measured on with the report cards. And so we've seen a lot of bounce in that data from year to year, I think partially because it's not been the tests that we've put a lot of eggs into that basket, if you will. Um, and so you'll see some, some variations in the numbers, which we hope as we um, you know, put a better implementation of that assessment into play moving forward that we'll see some of that smoothed out. Um, so for ELA, we saw a decrease of about six, a little over 6% over 17, 18. The state also saw a decrease, although not as uh, extensive. Um, it is worth pointing out that 14 of the 16 Waukesha County high schools that we compare ourselves to also saw a decline. Um, in math, we also saw a, a decline, a similar decline actually from 17-18. The state saw a smaller decline and about 11 of those comparable Waukesha County districts saw a decline also. So a lot of regression on ACT Aspire across the state. And then on ACT, um, our overall composite score for MHS students last year saw us drop about one point uh, over 17, 18. Um, statewide, students saw an average decrease of uh, two tenths of a point. And again, in Waukesha County, we saw 10 of the 16 schools that we would compare ourselves to saw a decrease in that overall composite score. Following those those points from the data release are graphs that show you um, just where we fell in comparison to the other uh, comparables that I'm talking about. Um, you'll see on the first page there, the forward exam for English language arts and math, English language arts up top, math underneath. Um, we are color coded in blue if you have the correct one in front of you and the state average would be color coded in red. Any districts that have an asterisk, those are arrowhead feeder schools basically, those are K-8 districts. So I set them off a little bit. They're a little bit different than we are, but still worth comparing ourselves to. And then a little bit deeper into the packet, you'll see the ACT Aspire for English Language Arts and Math as well. That's only administered in ninth and 10th grade. I've got ELA and math here for you, although that test also covers um, science and um, there's an English section and a reading section actually that combine to an ELA. And then there's a writing portion as well. Those pieces are not counted on the four, on the, um, school report cards. Same color coding, <laughs> blue from Iguanago, red from the state average. And then the final piece there is the statewide ACT composite average for last year as well. It's a lot of numbers I just threw at you, questions that you have either on the report cards or on the statewide assessments. I have a question, um, although this is all very positive and wonderful information, my question is what results or, or what, what commentary do you have at all about the ACT Aspire? changes. Can you add some color to that for us? In terms of the test itself, in terms of the state adding it, um, just the Any or all of the above, probably the test itself. Okay, so Since the- Now we have to look at it. Yeah, so the ACT Aspire test is a computer test. It is not um, adaptive. So each student gets the same repertoire of questions. It is timed. Um, and so we have administered this historically in pretty large sections with our ninth and 10th graders. The goal has been to try to minimize instruction around the rest of the building. Again, at the time, our understanding was it wasn't counting on the report cards, and it wasn't. Um, so, you know, we administered the test. I don't know that our students took it as seriously um, as we take forward exam, for example. We spend quite a bit of energy and uh, time for forward exam and ACT, trying to make sure that we take that one seriously. Um, but Aspire, quite honestly, we've, we've administered that in one day. They've been fairly large sections things that we're going to be addressing for this year to ensure that our students can perform the best that we know they can. And none of these are going away from a state standpoint. Not I mean, any not time ACT, but the other two. Not anytime soon. I think these are, these are pretty much here to stay okay. until they decide to change it. <laughs> can you guys speak to ACT also and our plans to improve the ACT scores? I, it may, I'll just, maybe real quick. 
I do want to make sure that our school board remembers that uh, we've put a lot of time and effort into our strategic plan and one of our goals is to make sure that all of our students are college and career ready. We've invested a lot of money into the McGuanago High School facility and our CTE programs and we've had a tremendous increase in the number of students that are taking CTE courses. That's been fantastic, and for many of our students, that's a great pathway, but those courses do not prepare them for success on the ACT. And so I think that's something that we have to be prepared to have that discussion at the board table and then in the community that if we are going to have a large percentage of our students, whatever that might be, 30% or 35%, that are not gonna take a rigorous course load that prepares them for the ACT exam and instead go the CT route, that's great, but we're not gonna have the same kind of scores on the ACT that some of our competitors in Waukesha County do. But that said, we also wanna do some things for our students who are college bound to make sure that they are well prepared for the ACT and to uh, score better on that test. And so you guys can speak to that a little bit, what we're going to do differently. Yeah, so some of you rem may remember over the past couple of years I've come and we've had a positive trajectory on our ACT scores. And so to lose a point after some positive gains the last several years is, was really disappointing to us. Um, and so we spent a lot of time brainstorming over the summer and into fall about what could the possible reasons be. You know, I'm a numbers guy, so I, I was looking for a smoking gun. Was there you know, one piece that we could point to. And whether good or bad, I don't know. I mean, on one hand, it's probably good that there's no single piece we can point to to say, gosh, that was it. On the other hand, it makes it a little harder to peel back the layers, try to figure out what's going on. So one of the pieces is what Sean said. Um, clearly, as our, you, you know, we, we celebrate being, uh, you know, preparing our kids to be college and career ready. And we do a really great job on the career ready side of things, more so than maybe some other districts do that does come with a, another piece, right, like as Sean spoke to. Um, you know, some other things we've talked about internally and, and you know, it's hard to put a, a finger, you know, kind of a finger on. I mean, obviously one of the big changes last year was the schedule change. We discarded that as, a, as an option because to be honest, the ACT really is measuring what kids have done for multiple years leading up to that. It would be awfully surprising if a schedule change in one year would have that great an impact on that junior year test. Um, it, it, it's just really, really unlikely. Um, you know, we have had some curriculum changes around ELA and math. Um, you probably, some of you might remember me last year around forward exam saying I was really thrilled that we did not see an implementation dip in like ELA for forward exam as we will sometimes expect to see. Um, it, you know, that's the exception, not the rule. And so with some of the curriculum changes at the high school and in the middle school in the preceding years, that could have an impact on it. Um, you know, another possibility that we're really exploring and trying to push hard is making sure that our students are adequately prepared for the ACT as well. And that's probably one of the bigger pieces that we're going to be focusing on. Um, you know, there are current school districts around us, New Berlin, Stephanie can probably speak a little bit more to that, whose juniors have multiple exposures to a full ACT test in true conditions. And a number of our students don't have that background. The, the first time they take ACT, is that statewide administration date in February or March. ACT is a different beast. Um, if you've never taken that test, if you've never experienced the types of questions on that test, the time limits, the way that it feels, the way things are worded, it can be pretty jarring. And particularly for students who maybe are on a different trajectory, um, you know, they might be able to perform better, but we need to give them exposure to that test. So one of the things, that a couple things that we're, we're doing here. First, this March, when juniors are taking the statewide administration, we are offering an optional sophomore administration. It's a practice test, it's not an official administration, but it will be administered with the same time regulations, the same prompts, the same everything basically that the juniors who are in a different part of the building will be experiencing. Um, our plan is to try and offer more of those opportunities uh, for our sophomores and then as juniors next year be able to give them that background, that experience. 
Um, we've really expanded our use of method test prep, which we uh, began to integrate into some of our initiatives at MHS last year through career cruising. It's not career cruising anymore, it's Zello, I think. Um, and so that's something that we have integrated into some of the advisory periods, um, and we push some information out to parents with that. That's free test prep software. Kids can take practice tests, they can take lessons that are you know, specific to the things that they really need, um, and it's, it's really highly rated, so something that we wanna put in our kids' and our families' hands. Um, you know, we've also, in parent letters that we just sent out, reminded them that the ACT offers some free online test prep materials as well. Um, so those are sort of the beginning pieces. Uh, really, the core is to get kids more exposure to the actual ACT test in testing conditions so that they know what to prepare for when they take that junior statewide administration. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to add that there's really clear data that shows that taking the exam twice raises the score. I mean, just that alone. So it, it seems only right, especially because a lot of our juniors are then submitting that, that's the score they're submitting to the state um, or any colleges they want to go to, that we're giving them every opportunity to, to make that improvement. Um, and so I, I think we'll see gains just by giving them the test a few times for the reasons that Ben was talking about. Any other questions? Okay, then 2019 summer school. I've got some more good news for you. Let me give you a little background first, um, just to get everybody up to speed here. Um, as you may know or may not, um, all of our summer school programs last year were hosted at McGuanago High School for the first time. There were a couple of reasons why we did that. Uh, the first most practical reason was we had construction at a number of our elementary schools. Made it completely impossible to host summer school at any of them. Um, besides the fact, last year, uh, so let's say two summers ago, 2018, we saw a pretty big increase in summer school attendance. We went to more of an electives-based program and we saw a jump in interest. We quickly realized we were at the point where none of our elementary schools would be able to have the capacity to fit our current program if we had any further expansion, which of course we want. So it was sort of a dual purpose to, to host it at McGuanago High School. It made sense because of the construction, but it also fit our needs. Um, it also allowed us to make use of some of the lab spaces as a result of the renovation. So some of the CTE spaces, the foods labs, um, you know, the, some of the other renovated portions of the building, the extra gym space it allowed us to use and not interfere with the clubs and other activities. Um, just, it was able, we were able to put us all under one roof. That also allowed us to enhance some things, you know, like having a school resource officer present, we had a social worker present, uh, present for summer school, um, both of whom were kept busy. Um, we were able to keep all of our administrative energies kind of consolidated rather than spread out across multiple buildings. It also allowed me to offer some other you know, creative uh, courses, including things like Indian athletic performance, formerly speed, strength, and conditioning to kids as young as fourth and fifth <coughs> grade. All of which we hoped when we did this last year would really see some increases, particularly in our elementary um, enrollment. So I'm happy to report that that's exactly what happened. So you can take a look at the graphs. They're on the first page of my memo. You can see we, we sort of bottomed out at the elementary level in uh, you know 16, 17, and then once we put those elective programs in places uh, in place starting in 18, we really saw a jump. Last year we gained almost uh, a little over 100 students again. I cannot promise you that I'm going to come back to you next fall with another 100 student gain. I hope we do. I can't make any promises because this is really unprecedented growth for us. Um, layered along in that graph is also the Eagleville E3 numbers. See, we took a slight step back, and that's a little misleading. We were full entering June, but we had a fairly large number of families that canceled like, their registrations at the last minute. Not really sure why it does happen from time to time, but that actually costs us about the nine, nine students or so, because we were full um, heading into the summer. So a slight drop, it's more statistical noise than anything, but that program continued to be successful as well. If you go to the next page in my, my memo, um, <clears throat> I have a chart here that I'm probably gonna retire moving forward. This is just the elementary attendance, or the summer school attendance by elementary home school. If you remember a couple of years ago, those of you that were on the board at that time, we were trying to figure out why our numbers were dropping, and we had some theories, but 
we wanted to validate some things too. And you can see that enrollment across the elementary schools, with the exception of a, a slight drop at Clarendon of three students, um, you know, really, really increased. We saw some nice gains. Big Bend had their highest number attend, and that's even when Big Bend hosted summer school. Um, you know, Prairie View saw a nice jump, and Stephanie can speak personally to how challenging it's been to get our Prairie View families involved in summer school. To see 70 Prairie View students attend is, is really gratifying. So some nice bounces there. I don't, you know, unless you're really interested in having me report out by elementary building moving forward, I think, I think we're in a good place. Um, so a couple other key points I want to highlight though. So we continue to offer bus transportation from our elementary buildings, sort of hub stops, if you will. The nice thing is our middle schoolers and high schoolers could, and in some cases did take advantage of that transportation. Um, we more than doubled students taking transportation. And that is, transportation as a cost, parents are charged for that. Um, but we went up to 170 or 57 students that took that transportation. Um, we had increased interest by our teachers and we had over 50 teachers apply to teach. And I actually think that number is a little bit low because there was some interest that was expressed that we couldn't work out for whatever reason. Um, that's up another nine teachers over 18. And that's really at the elementary level. Um, we, all, we were able to offer at least 60 unique classes and we had sufficient enrollment to fill 59. And honestly, if some of those classes would have fallen in different areas, I think we could have filled more. Um, and so we continued to offer 4K, that enrollment increased slightly as well. So a lot of positive indicators there for our elementary program. The challenge now is to refresh those offerings, to continue to get more and more teachers. Stephanie just asked me tonight, like if we grow any further, do we have the staff to do this? If you would have asked me two years ago, would I think we had the staff to offer almost 700 kids? I would have said there's no way, but we did. Our staff stepped up. Um, you know, we made some increases to our compensation a couple of years ago with your blessing. Our teachers are finding that this is a rewarding four weeks now. So I'm really thrilled about that. Um, moving on to middle school, those numbers are gonna be a little misleading and I'll, I'll explain why um, as we look through. So I mentioned summer street, uh, speed, strength, and conditioning, now known as Indian Athletic Performance. That was really an official part of our summer school program for fourth and fifth grade and our middle school. So some of the bounces you see in numbers have to do with them being integrated as an enrichment class. That said, we definitely had more students taking more classes this year. I tweaked my language on that a little bit, but at the middle school language, uh, middle school level, we had more like student courses, if you will. We actually had a slight decrease in number of middle school students, but the students that were here took more courses. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. So to me, while I don't like giving back middle school students during summer school, I'm thrilled that they were here taking more classes and that's something that we can build upon. It means that the offerings we had at middle school were more engaging, they were going the right direction. And I think as we get a generation of kids come through the elementary program looking for those kinds of things at the middle school, I think we'll gradually see those numbers increase. You know, so now there is something to be said about the fact that it is harder to get middle schoolers for summer school and even harder to get high schoolers, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it might be that we are flat at middle school, but we're gonna try really hard to offer some really neat courses and try to get them here. Because I, I think we can do it. Um, that's why when you look on page three of my memo and you see that big jump of 316, a lot of that is Indian athletic performance. I'll be really honest. But it is good to get them involved. And I spoke actually with Andy Trudell and Mike Nawak last week about Indian athletic performance and they were thrilled with how it went. We've got some tweaks for, for this coming year. Hopefully we can get more kids involved. Um, a couple of other things regarding middle, middle school, summer school there. Um, we were able to offer some art and CTE classes. I think the, the class that I loved the most this year was a, what we called a DIY class. It was in our woods lab. And kids brought home chairs that they handcrafted, you know, that they were able to engrave, um, that they put together. I mean, it was, it, it was a little humorous watching them try to stumble out on the last day with these heavy chairs and the parents like, yeah, you're bringing home a chair. <laughs> but they were thrilled. And what was really nice is our CT staff who ran those courses, they were already talking on the last day about, okay, we gotta come up with a better project for next year. Yes, that's what we have to like do. Like a canoe. <laughs> I will pass that along. That's an excellent <laughs> idea. <clears throat> um, I mentioned the Indian athletic performance bump and the fact that our, our overall number of students dropped just by single digits, but 
they took more classes, the kids that were here. Um, <clears throat> and we had a small number of sixth graders taking some of the remedial classes this year as well. High school is a different, um, a different game here. So we did offer, we actually offered one set of biology dissection classes as an enrichment offering. So I did have a teacher that stepped up to offer those. Um, we had two students that registered for each of those, and that's just not enough to, to pay for a class. But you can look at the rest of the numbers there. Our online classes um, were pretty steady. Um, you know, we didn't have any of the sort of traditional classes this year. Didn't have any teachers that offered to teach them and didn't really have a need. Um, credit recovery, we saw a bounce. We saw a nice increase there, being able to offer students that needed to make those credits up. Um, our staff in the, the credit recovery um, program is doing a great job identifying those students and making sure they get them here to keep them on track to graduate. So I know we don't like talking about that, but there's a need. And um, it's a nice opportunity to get our kids into summer school for those that need to graduate on, or that we want to graduate on time. Um, I keep trying to push for classes at the high school for more enrichment classes, but when we have offered them, we haven't gotten a lot of reception and we don't have a lot of staff really interested in teaching. So again, I will push this year. I will try to promote, get some offerings but I'm also pretty realistic that our high schoolers are split in a thousand different ways during the summer as well. So we might not see an increase in those numbers due to those factors. Can so. you look into more online classes? I mean, my kids would have taken more <laughs> if they had it online, but sure. they, they took everything online possible. But yeah, we just don't have a lot of offerings for. Yeah, right now we offer an online Physical Education 1 and Online Physical Education 2, two Online yeah. Health and Online Tech and Society. Yep, they took all of them. And <laughs> if you've taken all four, then yeah, you're pretty well capped out. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. We can talk about what other courses would lend themselves well to that right. as more credit offerings. Because when they have a busy schedule, it fits in. They mm -hmm. just do it when they have time. And, and these classes are sought after. I mean, we have many, 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 many more kids request them than can fit. And so we actually end up with, a, with what we think is a very fair pecking order. Kids that are closest to graduation get first crack at it, and then we do a lottery when there's you know, leftovers at a grade level. Because obviously we want our kids that are closest to graduate, we get those credits, you know, get that in your schedule. Um, so yeah, we can take that back and see what other, what other offerings we could come up with. I think that's, that is definitely an area we could expand. Last but not least, the Indian Athletic Performance um, Sheet. You can see we had a slight increase after several years of seeing a, a reduction there. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that doesn't factor into those numbers is the fact that we also had 37 fourth and fifth graders that took an elementary one hour version of this class too. So that was, that was really part of my, my hope when we moved to MHS. I've heard in the community fourth and fifth grade parents wanting their kids to be able to take a, a version of this we were now able to let them do that. And so we had you know, almost 40 kids that took us up on that. So I think a lot of positive things. I mean, this is a different summer school beast than we talked about. And um, you know, I really appreciate the board's support over the years in terms of allowing some increase in compensation for our teachers, certainly the prodding to offer that go back to the electives again um, and allowing us to offer transportation. And I think you know, we still have some room to grow. I don't know how much, but um, you know, I think there's still some room for growth there. Questions in summer school? I have a question about the remedial middle school classes. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty big bump from last year to this year. What do you attribute that to? Are we screening better? Is it just this particular class maybe? Like what? Well, the big reason is we were able to offer science and social studies this year and I just realized I've got science listed twice. There was a math, there were math remedial courses as well. You know, the big difference is we were able to offer remedial classes in all four content areas. And again, part of that was because we were all hosted under one building. So whereas at the middle school, when middle school, summer school is broken out in its own program, we were hurting for teachers there. And it was pretty kind of patchwork quilt. Here, when we're at MHS, I was able to stitch some things together to be able to, to really build our numbers of teachers. So um, you know, we probably had close to 45 kids that landed in those remedial science and social studies classes. And if you look at the numbers across, that's that's about the gain that we made. Was it just math and ELA last year? Um, in 18, 17, 18, I think even going back to 16, it was primarily math and ELA. We might have had 
Might have had a science or social studies, but they were very, very low numbers. I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember the last time we were able to offer those two work. Right. Actually, the science, that, that worked out well because we had a teacher that taught science and then some, some STEM classes to go with it. So when you've got multiple grade levels at one site, it gives me some flexibility to <coughs> be creative with scheduling. Good Any other questions? Yeah. I was just going to say, in addition to the online, we said that there's this lottery. Uh, wouldn't teachers just try to get, open another section, or you know what I'm saying, so that you could increase the number that you serve? Because even that number would. So there's th there's a couple of factors at play here. I think one, um, our PE staff is careful to not over enroll during the summer because they don't want to completely siphon students off during the school year too. You know, so there's a balance that we play there. Part of it is because the teachers are also, they're taxed like in terms of how many sessions they can teach. So we taught three online PE1 and one online PE2 and those were by two different teachers. So we could, we could probably offer a couple more sections but I'd have to, I'd, we'd have to have the staff in place to do that. So, um, you know, we can, we can discuss do that. We, do we only use staff that's already staff or do you pull from other places? So for the online courses, we do use MHS staff um, because those, those are four credit classes. For other summer school programs, we have brought in outside of district employees, but at least for the time being, we've stuck with MHS staff to do the. But there are credit. other pools of people. If staff is if staff is the issue, there are other pools of people, students from Carroll, students from Whitewater. You know what I'm saying? Sure, I do. Yeah, we could we could you know if there was the the desire to expand those offerings, we could we could certainly look. Um, both within and outside, whether or not we could get more teachers in for those. I just want to, so we're going to keep the elementary in for the high school? Yeah, I would like to keep it all under one house. I, I, I just think it, it, it works out really well. There were, I'll be brutally honest, the first day was a challenge. Um, it was literally like opening up a brand new school. And so even though we put a lot of work into trying to figure out all of the challenges that would go into the first day, we had some issues. Um, but we didn't lose anybody and we didn't have any car accidents. <laughs> that's and, uh, that's you know, how we so look like at every, practice. Everybody that got dropped off in the morning got picked up in the afternoon. Yeah. And, and uh, honestly, there are some days where that's, we will take that as a victory. Exactly. Um, <laughs> we fixed some things for day two which got wrecked by day three because for the first time in the days that I've been running summer school, we had rain at pickup. And so like, we can't have 600 kids standing outside in the pouring rain or in a thunderstorm getting ready to pick up, so we had to make some changes. So I mean, I was thrilled our staff was adaptable, but yes, we wanna keep it at the high school. Um, we will work on our transportation options, try and smooth some of those things out. Um, it was so exciting watching kids in the foods lab, in the, I said the woods lab. Um, there are spaces in that building that we haven't even tapped into yet that we could offer some exciting things and it really showcases the work that we've done in the high school. So, you know, and I'll, there are two other points I wanna make about bringing our elementary kids there too. And I know we had some families that were concerned particularly about their younger students. Um, we had a lot of pieces in place to make sure those students got where they need, it got to where they needed to go safely and promptly. Um, we're gonna do some things differently this year. We're talking about doing an open house prior to summer school so parents can walk their kids around the building. Um, but I'll also say that after about three, four days, we would have parents that were very nervous about bringing their kids in, but the kids would be like, I got this mom, I got this dad. Like, <laughs> like literally, hard. like yeah. you got this under control. <laughs> um, the second thing is, and this was something that kind of came up over, over <laughs> summer school, is this demystifies the high school for our younger students. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really neat that they get to go and spend four weeks at summer school, feel like a big kid, and when they get to high school again in some number of years, there won't be this mystery behind the high school. I, I know about all of you. When I went to high school years and years ago, it was like this scary. awful, yeah. scary place, right? Um, MHS isn't like that. It's a beautiful building. And our kids going there, getting familiar with it, I think it's a really great opportunity um, to really showcase what's going on there, but to make those students feel comfortable so that when they get in as freshmen, it's not a scary place. We've been there. I, I've walked around the building. I know what I'm doing. And so that's, a, that's another benefit to having everything there. No, I, 
I totally agree, and that's one of the things I was going to point out. So, and I'm sure all the board members agree with that. I mean, it's just they'll be so so much more comfortable coming into the high school. That's huge. Same with the music and seeing the stage. They want to stay involved in, you know, orchestra and band and things. Well, that's my point to like food, CTE, like all of those different offerings. Like, this is one way you're going to build your numbers in the future too. Yep. Kids get in in these early grades and they see these really cool labs and they see the cool things that they can <coughs> do. They will want to come back. Huge. Yep. You know, and that's that's a another sort of method to my madness with this as well. Excellent. All right. Thank you. All right. St strategic plan update. Well, we're. While we're uh, working on that transition, just curious, I know you guys are super busy and you weren't in summer school this past summer. Any classes that you think we should be offering at the high school that might be of interest to high school students? <coughs> I'd say with my grade, with the junior class right now, we are required to take personal finance. And I know that's a class that some kids have had issues fitting into their mm -hmm. schedules. Like I wasn't able to take it this last year. So I'm either going to look into a way to try to find somewhere to take it over the summer or take it my senior year. So I'd say that maybe just that one. That might be an online uh, option, Ben. Or you face-to-face yeah. -face yeah, or face-to-face, -face. yeah, absolutely. Online. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> online, online. Yep. Right. Thanks, guys. Okay, so we also wanted to tonight to give you um, an, our first update on the strategic plan that you passed about 60 days ago. So we've had about 60 days with um, this plan. And just to give you an idea now that you've seen the data and the report card information, just where we are at with that. Um, so just a reminder that one of the things we are trying to keep in focus as an administrative team is is why we decided to go um, and embark on the, the job of a strategic plan to begin with, that it's going to provide us a focus as a district um, to the work that we need to do and what maybe takes priority at times over other times. Um, and also that we definitely want all of our stakeholders engaged in this process. Um, and so that uh, we have recently reminded our entire admin team of this, our building team also. Uh, a reminder again that we have four areas that we ended up focusing in on, some of which we've been talking about the data with tonight. Um, and there are four people here tonight um, also that are kind of taking <coughs> the lead on being in charge of each of these. So we've got um, somebody to keep a focus on what we're doing, the high levels of learning growth for all of our students, all students being college and career ready. Um, upon graduation, recruiting and retaining high quality staff, and ensuring our best practices for mental health in our building. So as far as our 60 days is concerned, um, it really can be summarized into communication and planning at this point. We did have an administrative council meeting that really focused in on what the strategic plan was so we could bring our building principals up to speed on this. And we looked at, we did an activity uh, during that meeting where we really looked at where we're at as a system with the strategic plan in mind, what we are currently doing in our buildings that's working well, and then what we need, we left with lists of what we need to do and create or what we want the future to look like which, with each of these four categories also. Um, we are setting up action plan meetings, uh, or we did set up action plan meetings in each of our buildings uh, Christine, Ben, and I met with each building principal to really look at the action plans that you have in front of you, and I'll talk a little bit about how those tie in, um, but making sure that we're focusing in on the work that needs to be done, and then in addition, we are going to, we offered to go to the buildings to talk to the staff about the strategic plan to make sure that we're all on board with this together, and I think the first one, I'm headed to the first building on December 11th to talk with the staff about that and answer any questions that they might have about the work ahead. Um, very clearly with our action plans and meeting with the, the schools, we've got some common themes that we've identified as part of the work, continuing strong literacy goals. We saw nice bumps at um, the 3-8 level with the forward exam as Ben told you about with literacy this last year, but making sure that we're continuing that work. Um, most of our buildings, we talked quite a bit about closing the gap 
and goals that have been set to make sure that we are focusing in on all students and, and growth with all students. And then uh, most of the buildings also <coughs> have related to our mental, our best practices in mental health, some sort of a, a positive behavioral intervention system um, and also modeling, recognizing positive behaviors and making sure that we're focusing in on those in buildings also. So that's, that's kind of been, that's taken up 60 days. Doesn't seem, um, seems like a lot of days and maybe not much, but we wanna make sure that we're doing the communication around this really well and that we're setting goals that really support this that everybody is buying into. Questions on the strategic plan or at this point any of the action <coughs> plans of the building? I have a question, Stephanie. I looked through them and they all looked really great with a lot of detail, except it looked like the high school wasn't completed yet. Um, so can you update on where you are with that? Because when you look at gyms relative to the rest, there's some empty spots. The high school had some, link, some links in there that unfortunately don't, you know, you can't follow the links on paper. Okay. So I will definitely, we'll keep that in mind in the future because when it printed off this way, so like some of the baseline data ended up being in a link. Okay, that's probably what I missed. Um, yeah, and. But you're happy everyone has followed through to your expectations at this point in time. Absolutely, I think okay. that we felt very solid sitting with all of the teams that they have, they have solid plans and more importantly are doing the steps that to get, I mean you can put anything on paper, but uh, re we really focused in on the action plans and what had been done already. Um, and yes, good things are happening. Thank you. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Made you guys sit up front for no reason. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. All right, student learning committee update <coughs> from November 7. If you can find your I'm in committee well, no, I've got it here. I was waiting for Stephanie to oh, get right. back to her microphone. I'm coming back. <laughs> so um, we went through, continued to go through the uh, planning for the classes that were put into effect for this year and get the details on that. So we did that. And then there were some um, revisions on the film is literature and the theater. I did want to address on that too. You had asked, the committee had asked me to touch base with the teacher and make sure that our board policy is being followed regarding, um, we're good. Um, I did touch base with her and I'm comfortable that um, anything she's doing is following board policy when it comes to videos in the classroom. Okay. And then we talked about the kindergarten report cards which are changing um, to be more similar to the first grade, right? Is that correct? No. Or more different than the first grade. They were very much like the first grade and so they've changed and if you would like to explain that, but. So uh, the kindergarten team felt pretty strongly after trying a different way that they, um, that it was better to report out to parents end of the year proficiencies versus what our first through sixth grade report cards look like, uh, which is reporting out each trimester. And so a committee worked on that and um, I do believe that we'll be reporting in a way that, that communicates things to parents a little bit better and our kindergarten teachers are feeling very strongly about that too. And then we looked at the course proposals for 2021 and there aren't as many because the last year was a schedule change so this year there's not the schedule change so there's only a few where last year there was like lots of them. And those will be on action items tonight to approve those. And um, then we were asked to look at the class size and after a considerable discussion, we decided that more information was needed, so it was kind of tabled and they're gonna get more information back for this month and then we'll bring back that information next month or when we figure it out. And the DPI report cards, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it, yep. Any questions for learning committee? Okay, personnel committee update. <coughs> Thank you. Susan, I'll let you touch on the teacher compensation update. So after um, looking at last year and then um, looking at the need to redo the compensation system, really went from scratch and really looked at a brand new system that is going to, um, we're looking at it really to look at um, 
using teachers' PPGs, the professional practice goal, and really looking at um, structuring it around supporting the strategic plan areas. So really aligning, um, and this is an optional plan. So what we're saying is teachers can choose to do this. If they want a chance at earning additional compensation, this is a voluntary plan. If they don't wanna do it, they don't have to do it. But then they aren't eligible for any additional compensation. Um, but really looking at aligning the PPG with their strategic, with an area of the strategic plan. So that really you have um, vertical alignment down from the strategic plan areas. And so we really wanna be supporting <coughs> that and really having everybody on the same direction. Um, so this is really teacher driven. Um, they have to write up a proposal and it has to be accepted by um, their administrator and we're looking at a team, a committee, that would be looking at approving these across the district so that we make sure that the same things get approved and the same things don't get approved. So that one principal isn't approving one thing and then we're making sure that they have the same amount of rigor. Um, the teacher also has to follow through and set up a mid-year uh, meeting as well as an end of the year meeting to make sure that they have successfully completed the plan in order to be eligible for it. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, we reviewed this with our administrative team. We need some more time to do that with them because we ran out of time on today. Um, and then we wanna work with a group of teachers to um, get their feedback on this plan as well. So there's more to be done on this, but we're on our way. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for all the work that you've done to that. I know that <clears throat> when you first brought it to us a couple personnel meetings ago, we had all kinds of options on the table and now it's kind of been narrowed down to this. So thank you for all your work. Mm -hmm. Sean, I think we have what, the fifth calendar option now? Yeah, we're, on, we're on calendar. <laughs> is, this, is this working? We're on option number five right now and that's the one in your packet. It's also up on the screen. And I am looking to get the calendar <coughs> finalized at our December 16 board meeting. Uh, but tomorrow in our key news for parents, so before we head out for Thanksgiving break, at the end of the day tomorrow, we'd like to just give our parents a little uh, heads up when our major breaks will be. So I'm hoping that we can agree on the major breaks. First of all, if you look at the calendar, the first day of school would be Tuesday, September 1. October looks a lot like it does this year. Near the end of October, we have parent-teacher conferences on Wednesday night, then during the day on Thursday, and then a no-student day on Friday. Uh, November, the Thanksgiving break looks similar, same as we've done for years, but you can see that November 3rd is a day off for students, but staff will be in for in-service. If you recall, we have talked about Rolling Hills being a polling place, possibly Mogwanago High School also, and that is election day. So the personnel committee had recommended that we take, uh, have no students in our buildings on that day. And then we, we can use that as a staff development day. This year we had a staff development day, in-service day at the end of September, and we're just moving that to November 3rd instead. Christmas break, you can see the Christmas break there. I, I don't know what we would change there. Move down here a little bit. The day off in January is uh, the semester break at the high school and the middle school. Have an in-service day in February. The personnel committee and others felt that it was good to get a little break in the long month of February, the short long month of February. Uh, the the pink day here in March, that is the ACT day. Same as we're doing this year, a little bit later though. And then spring break. Spring break will not be the last full week of March next year because Easter is early in April. On Sunday, April 4th, we're looking at the last partial week of March, first partial week of April, the week before Easter for spring break. And that is what most of the districts in Southeastern Wisconsin are doing those that want a common spring break. That's what uh, we've agreed upon. Then May, the only day off in May is, uh, there's no other days off in April. The only day off in May, of course, is Memorial Day. And then we get done on June 10th.
any Perfect. concerns <clears throat> about that? Just as a heads up, on here it says Labor Day in May instead of Memorial Day. Yeah, we've made that change. We're hoping that that goes. <laughs> also, we're not like changing that. Labor Day Memorial. <laughs> <laughs> we're the boards. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Even you can't change uh, our holiday. Uh, one of our administrators caught that. Hard as you try. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Sean. We've looked at it 400 times. <laughs> no, I'm really out of so if, if we're good, then we'll share those major breaks. Spring break, Christmas break, the start of the school on September 1 with uh, parents. And then we'll get that finalized on the 16th. Is everybody good with that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then oh. last thing that we had on here, uh, superintendent goals for 1920. They're in the packet, personnel committee, put them together. So if you have any questions, please feel free to look at them. But that's all we have for personnel. The rest will be covered in executive session. You can move on. Okay. All right, Finance and Facilities Committee. Uh, we had a couple of bus transportation issues we dealt with. Okay. Um, 1819 audit report we had with, I forgot his name again. Chuck Krieger. Chuck Krieger. Sorry. <laughs> Via phone, and we're in really good shape, as always. Um, audit report. Then we have the 1920 budget review. Do you want to add anything to any of these? I'm sorry. Uh, we reviewed the uh, budget uh, to date, year to date, as of November 13th. We uh, we were, at, as of that date, 27% of the way into the student contact days. So we had 73% of the student contact days left. So as a general rule of thumb, we would expect 73% of our budgets to be remaining, which in most cases they did. And with discrepancies, I explained why. And everything appears to be on track. As of right now, there's no concerns. And finally, we had a PEASD update on their long-term debt, which so, someday may become our. <laughs> yeah, obviously there's the Palmyra Eagle situation does require our attention. If that situation proceeds and goes forward, then there's potentiality that we receive some of their debt. So we have to be proactive in how we think about that and what we're doing right now to prepare ourselves. So in the finance and facilities packet, uh, Oh, Sean has it up there. I'm going to transition here real quick. View here. If I could rotate it, I would. If you turn your head to the side. <laughs> <laughs> the point here is in November of 17, 18, and 18, 19, that's when we hit our low water mark for our cash that's available at Citizens Bank. It's projected that there to be between 12 and 13 million dollars of debts assigned. So if we got half of that debt, then we that would give us you know six, six and a half million dollars of debt. We couldn't cover that with a uh, fund balance available, so we would be forced to borrow. And we could take a look at borrowing through a couple different options. One is doing refunding bonds, which is permissible under state law, or we could borrow locally perhaps with Citizens Bank. So I was just prepping the, the committee and, and telling you as the board tonight that there might be a chance that sometime in the spring, based on the way this plays out, that we'll have to do a issue debt. So I just want to prepare you all for that and that's for the reasons why. That's what we, years ago, we had to do it every year, right? And now that was just a short-term loan Sure. that carried us so until we got our... A lot of school districts do short-term borrow um, through October, November, and December when cash is at a low. Once uh, folks pay their tax, property tax bills, then we have an influx of cash that comes in in January and February. So there are peaks and valleys in the cash cycle. So November is that low point, and based on that low point, we don't have enough to have $6 million liquid to, to cover any debts assigned to us. We would have to make a move there. So I'm just putting that on everyone's radar. Different. More to come later. It'd be more long-term debt than short-term. That's what I'm that's what That I'm was saying. just like a short-term borrow for a couple weeks. And that isn't what this is? No, this would be a long-term borrow, structured over a number of years. Oh. I, I don't know what that might look like. <laughs> 
Is that your worst case bet, the $6 million? <laughs> the answer to that totally depends on how much e property value is assigned to us. So if we got 75% of the property value, that's likely we get 75% of the debt. If we got 50% of the property value, then we get 50% of the debt. So in, in our east-west proposal, that calls for 50% of the property value almost exactly. So in my brain, that's how I'm operating. Again, if this happens to go down, it's not that we're hoping it goes down, but we have to prepare ourselves to think like that. Thank you. Tom, and the mill rate would increase, correct? Uh, yes. In the presentation that I gave last Thursday, when we talked about some of those things, yeah, the mill rate would increase. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, then we'll move on to action items. We have appointments, resignations, retirements. So on page 46 <coughs> in your packet. We're asking for um, the acceptance of the retirement of Lou Puello, the assistant principal at the high school. Um, Lewis decided to retired due to a number of personal concerns and um, some health concerns and such. Um, he officially will retire at the uh, um, as of January 23rd, but he has a amount of leave that he's gonna be using until that time, so. I will I make a, I'll make a motion. I'll second. And I wish him well and thank him for his service. I have a motion and second, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries, and then we have personnel committee policy updates. Just a quick review of those policies, bylaw policies. There was only one change, and that was we needed to change the address of the district office <coughs> since the village had changed Highway NN to Veterans Way in the village. We had to update our policy to reflect that. That's all. That's the only change in those three, in those, uh, I think, five or six policies. I'll make a motion. Were you, did you add the public participation at board meeting just tonight? No. No, I, I brought that to the personnel committee policy. and I just shared that with everybody. I, yeah. there, there's no there's change. No change. Right? No change. No, I'm sorry. No, that was just. All right. I would like to second. Andy's motion. Okay, I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, um, MHS baseball softball project. Yeah we, yeah, we have this on the agenda. We should have put this on the last uh, agenda. We put this through the finance facility committee the uh, in October. So for just looking for official action to go ahead and move forward with this so we can begin to get building permits with the village and whatnot. I'll make I that motion. <coughs> I'll second. And we have a motion and a second. Any questions? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, no, motion carries. Uh, Finance and facilities policy updates, the alcohol, drug prevention, federal funds. Yes. So in your folder, we do have that policy because there was one minor change that the Finance and Facilities Committee had recommended. And that was related to if there was an event such as the balloon rally, balloons over Maguanago, a non-district sponsored event, if there was going to be alcohol served that the group would have to get prior permission from the board. Would that be accurate? Yep. And so we added that sentence into the policy. I make a motion. I have a motion. I'll second. second. One. Three people are fighting over the second. Any questions or discussion? <coughs> okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, motion carries. 2019-20 school safety drills. So a summary of those safety drills have been included. I emailed those out last week and I think you have them in your packet right now. So per state law, we are required to do this annually. So the summary of these drills is provided to you and we hope that you would accept those as presented. I'll make a motion. <laughs> I have a motion. Nobody jumped 
<laughs> I'll second it. And a second. <laughs> Any discussion? I just have a question or a comment. Um, I, I did read through these, and uh, you know, the thing that I think we look at first is like, how fast does this happen? How, how quickly do, do we go through these drills? And you saw a range, if you looked at them, from five minutes, of course, our smallest school, up to 15 minutes, with some schools hitting 10 minutes to complete what they wanted to complete. So is there a goal that you've set? I mean, God forbid we ever have to go through reality on this, but 15 minutes really seems like an eternity. Well, I, I, th <laughs> I think that. That's easy to say when you're reading a report and not right. living the real world, but I'm just curious if there's barometers. Is there, there's so much information now on, on this process, I'm assuming. I'm just, for conversation's sake, asking the question. Sure, so I, I participate in a number of these, not all of them, but for example, Parkview Middle School will go through, they spend a lot of time on it where they go through two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that'll explain why the start and end times are, are longer, but they, they take their time to go through those two and prep the students on what they need to do and how to react accordingly. Um, as for section elementary, you know, they'll spend some time once they go into lockdown to remain in lockdown um, requiring those students to stay patient and, and follow their script as to what they're expected to do. And um, you can't just go on lockdown for 30 seconds. So you kind of got to stay in it for some time there to kind of really simulate what you're hoping to get out of the drill. So um, as for the amount of time it takes to get into your classroom and doors locked, that goes extremely quick. So I, I don't want to create the... Uh, the idea that it takes them really long to get into a safe and secure place, that's not the case, that goes real fast. Okay, that's with, a better explanation. Thank with you. the fire drills, when we have evacuation for fire drills, then those are timed, and then yeah. obviously time is of essence to get out of the building, but for this type of drill, then it's up to each individual teacher on how they react and they assess the situation, whether or not they evacuate, or if they lock down. And so as far as the length of time, uh, there is no goal, just to be safe as possible. So I do have a question about just Alice, I don't know, their guidelines. I noticed one of them said that students who were in the restroom at the beginning of the drill remained in the restroom for the duration of the drill. Do our restrooms have locks from the inside? In the eventuality that this drill is not a drill and the protocol, at least that we're teaching, is that if you're in the restroom and the drill goes off, you see in the restroom, can you lock them from the inside? No. No. So is that something we, I suppose on any other given day, that could be <laughs> a that, vaping that, nightmare, <clears throat> but. That, that's why we don't have the ability to lock them from the inside, but dependent upon the grade level. So if Emily and Shannon are in that situation and they're not with a teacher, they are gonna make their own determination. So if they're in a restroom and they hear gunshots nearby, they will probably lock down as best they can in that restroom. If they hear an announcement, if they're on the east side of the building and the armed intruder is um, in the west gym, they will probably leave the restroom and evacuate and escape. So it, it you could probably talk hypothetical all day long. You, you can. Talk for hours. Yep. yep. But there's no way to have doors that, like when you go into lockdown, right, a lot of places have doors that just automatically lock, either magnetically or something. We don't have that ability, right? For well, we have, we have, we have, we have, not in, not we have. No, those like dividing doors. Yes, we have those in the hallways, for example, in the high school, to compartmentalize yeah. in, in uh, different portions of the building. But in our restrooms, no. Okay. One last question, Ben Benzinger, who sat right over there last year, mentioned that he's like, please don't say northwest, e north, south, east, and west in our drills because we don't know what direction is what when we're inside the building. And I did notice that that's still something the high school is working on, needing to focus staff on proper location notification. Is there a better way to do this to like name hallways? Can we have signage like, no, that's just the science hallway. Can so they know they're in the science hallway. We could assign a color. Well, they are assigned colors upstairs. Yeah. We could. Upstairs. We downstairs. Could downstairs. Teach downstairs. them direction. <laughs> <laughs> we do. 
in a crisis, in a panic we situation, it might need to do something them. where they don't feel like they have to think. I don't know. And, I just and I noticed get that. that it made the report. And I get that. So uh, we're going to have to come back to you on that yeah. one. No, that's fine. No, that's a good question, though, actually. Okay, so we did have a motion and a second. Any other discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. 2020-21 new course proposals. So we did discuss these at the Student Learning Committee. It was a recommendation of the Student Learning Committee that um, the courses go through. I did want to follow up on a question that you had asked. Um, you also had a question about digital fabrications and the innovation class at the high school. I did uh, have a conversation with Dustin about that. He said they're very aware of the fact that they're probably going to need to make some tweaks, but to keep up with technology, like that's, that's what we're going to have to do with those classes. So there is some overlap, he agreed between the two classes at this point that would be discussed um, if digital fabrications is um, approved tonight. Okay. All right, so did you guys get a chance to look at the proposals? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a motion to pass. I make a motion. Thank you, sir. It's for ceramics three, drawing and painting three, mobile app development, adapting music, content percussion, craft I'll dancing. Second that. No more. <laughs> okay, you have a first and a second. Um, any questions or discussion? My only comment was on, it was nice to see the stress management class in there, and mm -hmm. w where do we offer that? I mean, outside of this, is it obviously with mental health being a part of our strategic plan? Um, how else are we covering that as a class rather than Shannon being and proactive as opposed <laughs> to, they're both like, yeah, they're both active. Not in and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so girls. No, this really comment? would be kind of the start of, really? of moving okay. in that direction, I believe. And this is for what grades? I see Ms. Canfield's teaching. Is it? Uh, it would be an elective for elective. juniors, seniors, I believe. Any comments, girls? I'm just sad I'm a senior and I can't <laughs> take it next year. And I'll look into it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it said 10 through 12. 10 through, 10 through 12. 12. Thank you. Just seems like it's something. It, it, are, there, are there course materials for younger grades in this category? something maybe we should consider. Well, our social, our, our SEL classes at the, that are given at the elementary level and in the, into the middle school definitely have aspects of yeah, this. So it's not that we're not yeah. teaching, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It's done through those guidance lessons. Just a nice addition. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nope. Motion carries. Unfinished business superintendent report. So, just so we're all on the same page, there is a school board election in April, and Jill, Art, and Joel are up for re election. So, paperwork is in your folders for you. If you have any questions about how to, what to do with that, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to help you. Uh, our community education program is moving along, so Bob Slane has taken that bull by the horns and has done a wonderful job. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, and I think Jerry, and I don't know if anyone else, had attended a session at the WASB convention. I think I did that year. Yeah. And uh, the River Falls program is an outstanding community education program, adult education program. So Bob has been in touch with them along with a number of others. <coughs> and uh, we're starting to put some ideas together and uh, we can come back with more information in December. But I didn't want to get too far out ahead of you guys. I wanted to make sure you're aware that we're working on that. And we do plan to have some adult education classes at the high school this winter yet. And then the December committee board schedule our board meeting is on December 16, Monday, December 16. That leaves only two Mondays prior to that for committee meetings. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Right now we have December 2nd for Student Learning Committee, and then December 9 for Finance and Facilities, and then Personnel, for some reason, we had scheduled Personnel for 6 o'clock on the 16th. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you guys wanted to do something differently. Good. I'll be awake. You'll be fine. So December 16th. Yeah. Yep. At 6 o'clock. Okay. Are we going out afterwards? 
And then I, I forgot to mention that, but I do have that in my notes, the traditional social after the December 6th <coughs> meeting. If you guys are in agreement, then we'll make sure we get that posted appropriately. Okay, great. <laughs> and that's all I have. Um, really nothing for board president report outside of nobody contacted me this month about not wanting to go digital. So I'm assuming we're all in agreement, especially after tonight with all of these papers. Yeah? What? Sometimes digital packets. Digital. Like we have Instead to use of our all of fingers. these. All right. You will no longer get it like free when you're in. Yeah, we'll, we'll start to move in that direction. That, that's going to not happen overnight. So yeah. um, we'll probably do packets again, several packets for the December 16 meeting, but maybe we can shoot for our January meeting to have a digital agenda. I think when Sean and I were discussing it, they would put together something that is digital, and then if we wanted something printed, we'd just be responsible yep. for printing it ourselves yep. and bringing it over. What's this digital? <laughs> <laughs> Electronic. Pencils and post-it notes I are not no Chisel First and it's a with a calculator. All right. Um, and then we need to go into executive, or no, we want to do legislation response. Board member questions first. Legislation, I don't know if anybody had a question about our meeting with the governor or the state assembly leadership. We, we have not had any I more content. Sorry, I can't hear you. Have we had any more stuff with Mr. Noss? Uh, no, we haven't <laughs> as of yet, but hopefully in the next. So the decision on Palmyra Eagle won't be made probably more than likely until January 15. That's the deadline. That would be great if they had done it before. But the governor and uh, Robin Boss assembly leadership made it clear that they weren't interested in intervening in advance, that they would be willing to discuss options and assistance, financial assistance, if the district dissolved. They, they are interested in learning more about what can be done financially to help absorbing districts, such as us, if, if that was the case. So we have some time, but we definitely need to get in front of the Senate leadership and Senator Nass, yes. Hasn't happened yet. So if they would have consideration for that, would that be in lieu of this borrowing, if there would be something that needed to borrow from this? Is that the same money we're talking about? So. I, I don't know that they're going to be able to help with the debt, but I do think they're interested in helping with the revenue cap and you know, what do you think, Tom? Sure. Am I misspeaking on the debt piece? No. That was shot down almost immediately <laughs> by some. <laughs> so in terms of paying off debts that will not become that will not be uh, paid for by the state. I, I'd be shocked if it did at this point. At, at least on the, at those two meetings, there wasn't much interest in that. I'm not discussing being paying it off. I'm more discussing a, lo a low interest or no interest. That's exactly what we asked. That's that's what I'm instead of having to go to the bank and. Yeah, we'll be going to the bank and <coughs> paying those interest yeah. rates. Yeah, they can't. I mean, every single school district would get in line for that. <laughs> no, I meant that would the, be the problem for the dis dissolution money. Right, I know. I'm not talking about you know other money. I th I, yeah. I, I could see their hesitance in doing something like that because it ultimately would give school boards a lot more uh, freedom, I guess, or maybe uh, risk, uh, risk taking. I don't know if that's the right word, but knowing that your debts will be g given off to somebody else in a low cost manner, you want to have skin in the game to make sure you follow through on your obligations anytime you take out debt. So the state isn't interested in writing those costs off in any way, shape, or form. So we're looking at more full funding for resident students, additional funding uh, that consolidated districts get per student, $150 per yep. consolidated student. So those kinds of things they are more receptive to than the debt piece. I had some reports from your going to the PTOs and PTGs for the schools. So that uh, that's a question too, but I from the one that I heard and I was surprised that the residents our, and their, their resistance to it is the fact that why should we have to pay someone else's debt? Is that, is that accurate? 
So I, I have been going to the PTO meetings to make sure that our elementary parents, I haven't got to the high school and the middle school yet, make sure that they're aware of what's going on with the Palmyra Eagle situation. And some people have certainly expressed concern about taking on that debt. I don't think that's just the elementary parents. I, I think that's just a general concern amongst our residents. We get that. But again, I, I'd refer you back to that talking point that I shared a week or so ago. If we get Eagle Elementary and we get the students to have Eagle Elementary operating, six million dollars might not be a, a bad deal in the long run. Well, and I, sitting here, I understand that, but I didn't know what the reception at those meetings oh. back at you was. Um, I, I think they understand that point. I think that our elementary buildings are concerned about if we add Eagle Elementary, will there be boundary reorganization? I, th I think that's more of a concern for some. But nobody wants to take on $6 million of debt. Nobody's cheering or saying thank you. That's well, great. Right, right, and I think that's, that's the, the point we have to come back to. Yeah. The reason why we are talking to the state legislature, talking to the governor, we understand that if Palmyra Eagle dissolves, that we are very likely to get property, students, assets, liabilities, debt, because of our geographical location, because of the number of students, 255 that we already have open enrolled into our district. We are a natural choice, so it's in our best interest to try to um, make a tough situation better. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what I've been telling people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it does. Well, then it must be. Yeah, done. obviously. <laughs> we'll go with it then. All right. Any other board member questions? Okay. I'd like to make motion we go into executive session. Second. I will second. Carrie Cumi will call us.